This film is intended for eye surgeons for training and education purposes. Viewer discretion is strongly recommended. Hello friends. Using higher amount of fake energy cause excessive corneal endothelial damage? Well, this has been the common perception. Let's find out whether this perception is just a myth or a fact. She is a 80-year-old elderly lady with very hard brown cataract and I've scheduled her for fake emulsification. The side ports are created. Intercameral lignocaine is used followed by trepan blue. Dispersive OVD is filled in. The main 2.8 mm incision is being created. Now, I plan to create a slightly oval rixus with the longer meridian being the one which is parallel to the main incision. I'm using this technique after watching my friend Dr. Kiranjit Singh from Amritsar, India and he recommends this for heart cataracts as well as for postipolar cataracts. I'm trying this oval rexus in this heart cataract. It's not exactly very oval, but the longer meridian is uh, going to help me to perform longer sculpts. Hydro dissection is done gently using very little amount of fluid. The nucleus rotation is confirmed. Before I start, let us note the energy used here. It is zero, right? Now I'll be using the classical four quadrant divide and conquer technique. I begin sculpting and because of the old rexus, I can make a longer trench in this meridian. Please note that I'm supporting the nucleus with my second instrument while sculpting. Maximum amount of energy is used so that the nuclear material is effortlessly shaved off without any stress on the zonules. The aim is to get a trench which is almost 90% in depth. The nucleus is rotated and the trenching is continued until we have the classic plus sign. It's extremely important to have a trench which is as deep as possible because the cracking of the nucleus into four fragments will be easier. And I expect a very sticky leathery posterior plate in this case. These eyes will be lacking an epinucleus or cortex cushioning the posterior capsule. So during lateral separation maneuvers, there is a risk of posterior capsule tear occurring. Now is the time to crack the nucleus. Please note that I've changed my setting to chop mode. I'm using a short burst of fake energy to bury my tip into the one quadrant and gently lift it up and then using a second instrument I'm performing lateral separation. In spite of such a deep trench, it is still not easy to separate these leathery fibers. If need be, I always go back and fill the chamber with OVD before separating. Here I'm burying the tip as we do in the chop techniques before separating the fragments. I find this technique very well in these hard cataracts and has the least chance of producing stress on the posterior capsule or the zonular apparatus during lateral separation maneuvers. I bury, lift up the fragment just a little bit and then the lateral separation is performed. Of course, it takes a few attempts because of the leathery nature of the posterior plate. The whole idea is to be as gentle as possible and be effective. So finally I have these large fragments. The first fragment is pulled out and chopped into two smaller pieces. Then each of these pieces are consumed. The fragments are attached at their bottoms because of the incomplete separation. A short burst of FACO here releases them. The technique of FACOing the base where the fragments are attached is easier when the bag is relatively empty as is the situation now. 
which allows the fragments to be tumbled and then the point of adhesion can be fakeed easily. Before proceeding to emulsify, I first inject dispersive OVD anteriorly followed by HPMC under it inside the bag. I call this the modified soft shell technique. These are the parameters which are being used for quadrant removal. I begin emulsifying them slowly at the level of the iris. At this stage, my goal is to emulsify them without causing any damage to the corneal endothelium. The first fragment is emulsified. Now each of the fragment is emulsified in a controlled manner. The trick to have a clear cornea is as I always keep telling. Number one, minimal lens chatter and turbulence, posterior plane of emulsification and using adequate OVD to protect the endothelium. My second instrument is always held beside the phaco tip to prevent any lens fragment from flying away and hitting the corneal endothelium. The last fragment is to be emulsified. I refill the chamber with dispersive OVD first followed by HPM center 8. Now this is critical because we want the dispersive OVD to be present anteriorly more towards the cornea because it is thermogenic and can generate and transmit heat. That's the reason I want HPMC to be present near the capsular bag where the energy will be generated. Finally, the emulsification is completed. The little bit of cortex which is there is aspirated and the intraocular lens is placed into the bag. The OVD in front and behind the lens is removed. Let us pause and take a look at the total amount of energy consumed. Uh, this is the effective echo time which is significantly higher than what is used for most of my routine cases. Most of my routine cases would have a EPT of less than 10. Now, what we can see here is a lot of wound hydration and there is a small desmond membrane detachment flap which is floating around probably arising near the side port. It is tiny and should not cause any major issue. The side port and the main incisions are hydrated and that's it, the case is done. The first post-op day. This is how the cornea looks. In spite of a very hard cataract, a long procedure and having used a lot of ultrasound energy, we still have a cornea which is clear and shining. The phaco incision is fine. There's no gaping or no evidence of any thermal injury. Having Ozil really helps in the part that the thermal injury is very very minimal compared to the longitudinal energy. This part of technology helps in minimizing the wound burn definitely. So now we have the answer to our original question. So does using large amount of echo energy cause endothelial damage? Well this case shows that it is not true. So whenever we do the classical four quadrant divide and conquer technique we end up using lot of energy significantly more than the direct chop techniques. But this case demonstrates that the perception of more energy is always equal to corneal damage is in fact a myth. What is more critical is the plane at which the energy is delivered and also more importantly we need to prevent the mechanical trauma to the endothelium by these fragments. And this is controlled by minimizing the lens chatter and turbulence inside the chamber which is of course achieved by controlling the energy delivery through the foot pedal. Well, the message is that we can get clear corneas, first post-op days, even with these gear of cataracts in spite of using a lot of ultrasound energy. So this is possible if we follow certain basic principles during surgery. Thank you for your attention and hope you found this helpful.